So good evening all across the Great Lakes. As of earlier today, we had about 530 people register for this webinar from multiple states and Ontario. And I know I skimmed the list and I saw Minnesota to New York on the US side. So thanks again for taking time to join us. My name is Mark Breederland. I'm the host today. I'm with Michigan Sea Grant. I'm based here in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, this is truly a virtual geography webinar tonight. Uh, I'm actually joined by our Michigan Sea Grant communications editor, Geneva Langland. She's out of our Ann Arbor, Michigan office. And my district educator colleague, Elliot Nelson. He's based out of the Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan office. They are gonna be assisting tonight with uh, Q&A and chat information, and also just kind of backup in case of uh, internet outage. Uh, this program is designed to educate on shoreline principles. It's not really a focus on regulatory permitting per se. It's hoped where possible, you might be able to ride out this season of high water. But just a quick comment, while uh, different governmental jurisdictions may have different permitting processes, we feel the principles uh, tonight are applicable to whatever Great Lake that you're on. Uh, since this program is put out by Michigan Sea Grant, the majority of the attendees appear to be from Michigan. Um, I did list a couple of websites here on this screen. Uh, the Michigan.gov slash high water takes you to the Michigan Environment, Energy, and Great Lakes Department, and also the Corps of Engineers in the Detroit office. That's lre.usace.army.mil. They actually have a, a banner there that you'll see. The program is also being put on with assistance from MSU Extension, who has programs and materials that are open to all. It is my pleasure to introduce Margaret Boshek. Margaret's a seasoned Great Lakes Coastal Engineering Practitioner. She's a registered professional engineer, both in the US and in Canada. She's obtained her BSc in Ocean Engineering from the Florida Institute of Technology. She has a Master of Science degree focused on coastal and marine engineering and management from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. But she joins us tonight from Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to my home. This is uh, the first time I've been given the opportunity to give a presentation from the comfort of my abode here in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, come on in, make yourselves comfortable. And I'd love to talk to you about high waters on the Great Lakes and options for shore protection and stabilization. So today's agenda includes what's going on with the Great Lakes and why are the water levels so high? Why is the lake attacking me? What can I do about it? Who do I need to work with? And what is this going to cost? So what is going on with the Great Lakes? We all know the Great Lakes are incredibly high right now, but not too long ago, they were at record lows. So essentially, water level fluctuations in the Great Lakes are driven by fluctuations of water supply, which is based on changing weather patterns. What I'm trying to say is it's supply versus loss. Our supply is precipitation in the form of rain and runoff off of our, our land masses, and the loss that comes through evaporation. This results in our lake levels changing dynamically all the time. So uh, a graphic like this is very common. It is a average water level, a mean water level uh, for a month. And this has been recorded since 1918 by the Army Corps of Engineers. So not too long ago in 2013, as I mentioned, we were at record lows. And there was all these news reports about how our Great Lakes were evaporating and due to climate change, they would be gone. Well, I guess they were a bit wrong. So we had, following 2013, two dense years of ice coverage on the Great Lakes for Michigan and Huron of about 85 to 95%. This reduced our evaporation considerably, which increased the amount of water that was retained within uh, the Great Lakes Basin. This was directly followed by five of the wettest years on record. In fact, 19 and 18 were the two wettest years in 125 years. This has resulted in an increase of almost six and a half feet of water level between 2013 and today. What does this do to our natural shorelines? Well, here's an image from 2013 of uh, Lake Michigan Park that is mostly sandy in this location. And here's a picture from 2018. 
this is a uh, erosion of 425 feet in only five years span of time. Now, a lot of the sand is just pulled offshore along with all the vegetation that's in it. But before I get ahead of myself in talking about why this happens, uh, I also want to point out that those average water levels are not the full story. There's also meteorological forcing, which is a fancy word for storms and pressure systems that are passing by. This causes water to build up in some sections and also dri driven down in other sections. Here's a uh, about 20 uh, day period uh, in Calumet Harbor in Illinois. And we see the average water level is that red line going through. Well, on December 30th, we had a drop in our water. Uh, and that was about 1.2 feet below average. I should mention that this green line is a measurement every six minutes of the water levels at, in Calumet Harbor. Not two weeks later, we had a big storm system pass through and it pushed all that water to the south end of the lake and the water levels actually jumped up 1.6 feet. Now this only lasted for a short amount of time and it goes into the overall average water level for that month. But you can see that there's variation day to day that is otherwise not accounted for in those numbers. Everyone's always looking for a trend and I'm no different. I like things that make sense and statistics. So when we start looking at uh, Lake Michigan, there seems to be a cyclic nature of highs and lows of water level. And those are based on about a 22 to 23 year period. Now the last high water elevation that we had was back in 1997. This was uh, closely after a 1986 high, which is our actually uh, historic high over uh, the period from 1918. So that's a bit of anomaly because it's right smack in the middle of that 23 year span. But if we look at the statistics and we say, okay, the cyclic nature does make sense, then we are right on track with being at a peak in 2020. Um, but like all these peaks, and you might've noticed, they all go down afterward. And current projections for the future do show the water levels going down. In fact, right now, July of this year is the high point for, for uh, our, our water levels. And if statistics are true, we're gonna go back down now. That's the good news. So if I were to look into my crystal ball and say, what does the future bring? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't say, but the Army Corps of Engineers suggests that in the future, we're gonna have higher highs and lower lows. So this is just something that we're going to have to deal with. Plus, if you take, if you think that the, the trend does make sense and these statistics are accurate, well, then you need to plan for this uh, in the future because it could happen again in 10, 20, 23 years. So it's good to look ahead. So why is the lake attacking me? Well, before I jump into this, it'd be good to know who's out there and who's watching this. So a poll is going to pop up on your screen, and if you could please describe yourself. Are you a homeowner, a concerned uh, citizen, or maybe you work with a municipality, or maybe you're on the regulation side of things, maybe you're a consultant like myself, or you're my mom and dad who thought they would uh, help me out by watching. Great. Looks like we have a lot of homeowners and concerted citizens. And yep, looks like my mom and dad are there. Hi. Great. Well, it's good to know you're out there and it looks like we have a wide range of, of individuals here as well. So this is, this is going to cover everything, but not the six years of education that I received in coastal engineering. So it will be a high level approach to things, but if you have questions, you will be more than welcome to contact me or any of my colleagues thereafter. So if the one takeaway I want you to have from this presentation is that changing shorelines and fluctuating water levels is a natural process. This has been going on for thousands of years in the Great Lakes. And uh, just as there is um, destructive powers, there is restorative powers. The problem is when we get involved. When humans try to live in this dynamic zone, we try to make it static. And by nature, it's not static. So let's talk about waves and wave energy. Now at low water, there's a water depth offshore. As a rule of thumb, water uh, waves will start to break when they're about 60% of the water uh, depth. This results in a run up on the beach that kind of crashes and pushes up with wave energy, moving those sand particles around. Now, when we enter into higher water levels, 
that means the waves get bigger too. They get uh, larger, the run-up is larger, the energy is larger. And this imparts itself onto our soft, sandy shorelines and causes movement to occur. Now in a cross shore, this is kind of what happens. At low water, you can see the black line there of the shoreline. It allows the waves to break and run up on that shoreline and dissipate their energy. At high water level, these waves become larger with larger energy and more of a plunging action, which is pulling that sand offshore. Now the sand isn't lost, it's just brought offshore and deposited in bars offshore. Now you might notice that if the water level were to go back down to low water, the waves are actually crashing directly on this sand and they act to push that sand back up onto the shoreline. Now this, this action, this cyclic nature of uh, sand movement is called cross shore transport. And it intensifies with higher water levels due to the higher wave energy. But we live in not a 2D world, but a 3D world. So there's also movement along the shore. Waves approach not always at a perpendicular. A lot of times they're at an angle. And this actually drives the sand along the shore in a movement um, and pushing it downwards. Now, any of us who live along the shoreline, we see this. One day we'll have sand, a storm will come, the next day we do not. This is called longshore transport. And it intensifies with the higher wave energy. And again, the wave energy is related directly to the amount of water that we have in our lakes. These two processes are happening all the time together, whether there's uh, high waves or small waves or just even small winds uh, of, of forcing across the water. That is generating enough energy to move sand. Now we've seen what this looks like today with our high water levels is that a lot of our beaches have disappeared. Vegetation that was in a stronghold during those uh, 13 years of low water are now being subjected to waves directly. Uh, and, and a lot of their root systems are starting to become exposed. We're also seeing a lot of our soft sediments moving offshore and the heavier rock sediments remain onshore. So these are two pictures that I took uh, on, on Lake Michigan one year apart. And while it might not be completely uh, apparent that there is a difference, this is actually the same tree in both pictures. You can see how far back one tree appears versus the other tree as to the top of that beach system. Also in the picture on the right, you see more of those rocks that are left behind and that softer sediment that is taken offshore. But maybe you don't live on a soft sandy beach, maybe you live near a bluff. And if you're on an erodible bluff, the water level hitting your, or the water hitting your bluff is definitely an issue. At low water, we have a dry beach where waves can dissipate on that beach and never even touch the bluff. But as water levels come up, they start to hit that toe of the bluff and create a wave cut notch, which just scarps away at that bluff. This makes the sand above it and the bluff above it unstable. Now, a lot of it is held there by vegetation, but when that gives way, that entire bluff is going to uh, fall down and end up in the old location of where the beach was. This results in a net crosser transport offshore. Now, unlike beaches that naturally move up and down uh, with water levels and will repair themselves at low water levels, a failed bluff doesn't come back. Once it breaks and fails, it's done. So it's much harder to, to maintain. And therefore, if water levels are high enough that they are hitting your bluff, that's when you want to start to look into shoreline protection. Here's some pictures of sudden failure of a, a bluff system. This, you can see heavy sands and silts. Uh, and after a, a large storm, it just completely collapsed, taking the trees and all the vegetation with it. Now, all these trees that are also very close to that shoreline, their roots have now been exposed and they are now stressed. And those trees might end up dying, which reduces, further reduces the vegetation on that bluff. You might have stairs going down your bluff uh, onto the sandy shoreline. Those are now being directly impacted by waves. And a lot of them aren't designed to resist that type of forces. Uh, wave energy is incredibly powerful. So we see this now uh, littering the beach. And a number of these uh, wooden stairs or structures that used to be on dry sand are now broken up and becoming litter in our lakes. 
here's an extreme example <laughs> of uh, a failure and an actual slide of uh, this very soft, muddy sediment that was otherwise uh, stable when, when the toe was there and much further back. And you might notice that there's that house awfully close to the, the top of that failure, but beyond it, there's another house. Those uh, residents were smart enough to build a second house, and I understand that that one in the foreground um, was slated for demolition. Not everyone is so lucky. These pictures are from the 1980s when the water levels were this high previously. So this is not a new thing that we're experiencing. People have been building uh, their homes and infrastructure too close to the water for a very long time. And it never seems that we, we learn our lesson. So here's a, a couple examples of buildings that were completely abandoned and had to be um, torn, torn down after such an event. Now you might already have a hardened shoreline. The two most common hardened shorelines are revetments. Now they can be made from concrete, but typically we like them to be made from uh, stone or riprap. The other option is a seawall. Now this could be concrete, uh, or it could also be um, sheet pile, so steel. Uh, and these, these are, are two hardened shorelines that actually change your dynamic to the water as it makes it much difficult much more difficult for you to get down onto the beach and the water without other ramps or walkways. But they can also fail at high water levels. For your revetments, they can be overtopped, creating a bit of erosion on the backside, which opens them up and causes them to fall in on themselves. Once this happens, that soft sediment on the backside is completely exposed and can quickly start to disappear. For seawalls that, that weren't always intended for water to be hitting them directly, uh, if there is no scour stone to prevent any um, scouring at the front face, that energy is actually creating a scooping motion and creates a divot right along the face of that seawall. This also supports the, the larger wave energy. Um, now waves hitting into a seawall are going to shoot up with a lot of force and this creates a lot of overtopping that is then coming onto the backside and creating a hole behind the seawall. Now if the seawall is not designed properly or deeply enough, it could fail. It could actually fall forward um, from the additional weight now on the backside. A further effect of seawalls is that when waves are hitting directly against them, they are reflecting wave energy back. With this reflected wave energy, take sand. Uh, it, is, it is much more, more energy in, in the near shore and those soft sediments get pulled offshore. Now, because uh, a normal uh, sandy system doesn't have that reverse of energy as that water levels go down, in this system, it's harder to recuperate that sand that was built up in front of the seawall, even at low water. So it has permanently changed the, the lake bed in front of that seawall and even around it as there is radiating uh, wave energy as well. So seawalls uh, need to be designed by, by experts, otherwise they can have very negative effects to your, to your property. Uh, so here is an example of a seawall in uh, Chicago. This is during low water, and this gentleman looks like the, the saddest version of Baywatch that I've ever seen. But a few years later, we have water level all the way to the surface, and that way, and even though there's no waves in that picture, you can imagine any type of wave system is pushing water up onto that, that walkway and onto the, the um, bicycle path as well causing issues for anything on the, on the backside of that, that wall. Um, we've also seen pictures, and although they aren't in my presentation, of that concrete actually getting undermined by that wave energy and getting lifted and pulled off. Um, this can be very expensive to fix. Here is a concrete wall, seawall, uh, that was uh, designed many years ago and used to be a popular thing to do at that time. Um, the picture on the left is when it was still stable and water was a little bit on the lower side. And you can see on the picture on the right, which was taken about a year and a half ago, that overtopping and complete exposure of that uh, concrete wall, which was really just stacked blocks, uh, caused it the, the whole thing to unravel. This is a system that is not 
um, is not able to self-repair the way that uh, riprap does. A little bit of riprap movement, not a problem. You lose one or two of these blocks and the whole system falls apart. Uh, so knowing your risks on, on what type of system you are installing is also important. Uh, here's another picture of that same wall. This had a good amount of fill on the backside that was, um, that was holding that area in place. Once this wall actually fell forward, it exposed that fill, which was foreign to this area. And that fill has now entered the littoral system and is moving down and causing problems further down. So uh, not only is there the bad side of your, your shoreline protection system has failed, but now the, the remnants of it, the, the trash from it is causing issues um, in, in other areas and to its neighbors as well. So here's a seawall system that was built just too low. <laughs> you can imagine that the waves are coming in, hitting this vertical system and jumping over. Now, fortunately, they are ponding on the backside, but in areas where grading is actually sloped, this creates a bit of a river on the backside of a seawall, which will take all that soft sediment with it. Um, there are ways to restabilize this. Now, keeping it as a, a flat slope is a good start. Highly vegetating it is also a good start and maybe even putting in um, some type of buffer and, and splash pad, whether that be rock or geotextile or even geocells that can hold uh, rock and soils and allow vegetation to grow. Um, those are just options for, for reducing your risk on the backside of these walls that are already low. So here's another question for you. Uh, understanding that we have sandy shorelines, we have bluffs, we have hardened shorelines, um, describe the shoreline in your area and what, what effects that you, you might be having from them. And you can select multiple. Now, if you uh, live on a rocky, stable shoreline, good for you. You don't really have uh, too many issues with erosion at this, this time. Now, if the rock is eroding, you can put yourself into the eroding category. Now, heavy vegetation and mud, then you're probably in a more uh, secluded and um, an area that is uh, uh, not directly against Lake Michigan or in one of its uh, little embayment areas um, because otherwise that's kind of hard to support. Or maybe you're like me and you don't have any shoreline and uh, I, I live a couple uh, blocks from the lake but it is a future dream to be on the lake itself. Ooh, a natural sandy beach. So that, that is a, a, a big one around here. And that does mean you are in a dynamic zone, but it also means that it's not really messed with until you start to put in any shoreline systems. So we're gonna talk about possibilities of, of um, protection for yourself and your property on, on all of these uh, different um, shoreline typologies. Uh, but yeah, oh, and hey, stable rocky people. Good job, you chose well. So moving forward, what can I do about it? Well, I would be remiss to say that there aren't temporary protection systems. Some people are doing their own thing in front of their own, uh, their own homes. And those come with varying forms of, of success. Now this is a, a sandbag system. You see a small one over to the left in combination with a geotextile, or you see much larger ones on the picture on the right. Um, now, both of these work for a short amount of time. They are not meant for the long haul. And they will possibly, depending on where you are, get you over this hump of high water before the water level starts to uh, drop again as it's already forecasted uh, for the, the months to come. Um, they do have their, their, uh, their place, um, but they are not long-term solutions. And this just means that in the next 10 years or when the water level is high again, you're just going to have to spend the money all over again to reinstall them or reapply them. Another common one I hear about is gabions. Uh, these are either wire or a plastic netting that is held around smaller rocks. Um, rock is rather expensive at the moment, which I will get into as well. Uh, so people will purchase smaller rocks and put them into these bags as a form of protection. Um, they are good in a shorter time period, but over the long haul, uh, they do sometimes have their problems as seen in this image uh, where that, that bag is starting to break. And those rocks, once lost, um, they're completely lost because the wave energy is just that high that it'll pick it up and move it and you'll never see it again. 
that or it ends up all over your sandy beach, making it a little less attractive for recreation purposes. So here's a buzzword, living shorelines. Everyone loves living shorelines and I hear this often from my clients that they want a living shoreline. I would love to give you a living shoreline. However, they are not the best solution in areas with a lot of wave energy. But let's talk about what is actually a living shoreline. Well, it includes about three things, vegetation and vegetative uh, um, shorelines right up to the waterline. We have edging, which is more of a coconut mattress or geotube or some type of natural uh, system that is protecting the toe of your beach or that interface where, where the sand meets uh, the water. And its purpose is to protect the vegetation on the updraft side or the land side. And if, if that's not enough, then we go into something a little more uh, heavy duty, which in this case is concrete sills. Now this creates that barrier uh, between the vegetated slope and the water. This is all that's considered a living shoreline. So when people talk about having um, habitat forming breakwaters or groins or anything like that, that's great. That's a, a habitat overlay, but it is not within that definition of a living green shoreline. Um, leaving a system natural, that is always the preference, uh, but that isn't always a possibility either. So these types of systems do have limitations and you really don't want to consider them unless your waves are very small and we're talking under a foot it, during a storm because storms will last for a number, number of hours and tear away at your shoreline. Uh, you want to have gentle slopes, no steep slopes um, raising up out of the water uh, to your shoreline because that just creates wave energy right at that interface. And then we also look at sheltered shorelines, those that are in um, smaller lakes or in baymans or anywhere that you're just not going to get wave activity. Uh, those are more appropriate for the living shorelines. Now you can create these, these environments by breaking down the wave energy with other systems, but those have to be in tandem with more of your gray, hard structural solutions. So a little more natural, but not considered a living shoreline is a beach nourishment. And this is just re reinstalling the natural system that was already there. Now this is done in a few of the states along the Great Lakes, but not all of them are exploring this, this uh, opportunity. Um, beach nourishment does have its pluses and its minuses because it is recreating the defense system to whatever you're trying to protect, whether that be a bluff or infrastructure or anything else but it is erodible and it is subjected uh, to moving both in cr cross -shore, shore and longshore transport uh, solely by the, the number of waves or the wave energy coming in. Uh, so it, it, is, um, it, it is high maintenance. Now, one way that you can make your beach nourishment stick around a little longer is you look at the natural grain size that was lost and you increase it because wave energy uh, lifts those, those sand particles and moves them. Now, if your sand particle is heavier, it is less likely to do that or it can only uh, um, lift a, a smaller amount. And that just um, uh, increases your retention time of your sediment along your shoreline. The other option, a little more on the, the living shoreline sign is dune vegetation. This takes a long time to establish. So if you're looking for a quick fix or, or something that's going to help you now, this is not the solution, but it is definitely something you should look at for, for future planning of stabilizing your shorelines. And once that dune vegetation is established, don't touch it because if you start to, to manipulate with it, it will die and start to open up pathways for um, additional erosion. And one thing I do want to mention about erosion, it's not only um, waves that cause erosion, but winds can cause erosion too. So a denuded beach is more likely to be moved around by winds uh, than one that is covered in vegetation. So plan your pathways through the vegetation very specifically and keep to those and try to maintain the vegetation as much as possible. The considerations for these more nature-based uh, engineering solutions are that they are a higher risk, they can still erode, and this does result in a higher maintenance um, and a more, more frequent maintenance. More structured-based engineering, this is when you get into breakwaters and your groins and your more hard solutions. Now this picture of breakwaters that are offshore 
is more on the natural side of things because it's not stopping sands from moving. It's actually just slowing them down. It's reducing that wave energy as it gets closer to the shore. And in reducing that wave energy is less likely to, or less able to pick up the sands and move them. So it's slowing down that rate of transport. It is not stopping it. And this is great because then you're not influencing your neighbors. You're not causing any problems. You're just slowing down that rate of movement, uh, of sand movement along the shoreline. So we have breakwaters, which are typically made out of riprap um, and other rock. And again, you can do even an environmental overlay on those breakwaters to make them more inviting to both fish species and avian species. The other option is more shore perpendicular. Uh, these are groins. So this is an area in Chicago that uses groins and groins were very popular once upon a time. Um, they have fallen out of favor uh, because they do have a negative side. They collect sand on the, um, on the updrift side of, uh, of, of the groin. And on the downdrift side, as you can see in this uh, image here, it actually causes erosion because we are uh, stealing from Peter to give to Paul. And this creates that scalloped uh, shoreline. Now, again, there are coastal engineers out there who can design systems that will have low impact on the neighbor, but you can't just do one groin. It's more of a field and a family and they have to work holistically. Uh, so a singular groin it has uh, negative impacts for, for those in the downdrift area. So some considerations, there's, there's still some risks with both of these uh, structure-based engineering options. If water levels are high and you still have really high wave energy, sand is still erodible. Those, the, both of those systems can be overtopped, which will just, again, pull that, that soft sediment offshore. And then you also have uh, structure maintenance. You have to keep up with these things. If they start to fall apart or break, um, they do require some, some maintenance. And then we have a completely hardened shoreline. This gets back into the revetments and seawalls that I mentioned earlier, and they're, they're um, changing your relationship to the water. And these need to be used in, in some areas where there's just no other solution that you need to protect the toe, particularly when it comes to bluff situations is when we want to look at revetments and seawalls. Um, but uh, they, they should be the last option when all other options are just not going to, to work for you. So in this case, here's a picture of a stone revetment, and this is actually used in combination with a bulkhead wall on the back side. So if there was any bit of overtopping and such, it would hit that wall and not actually influence the bluff that is safely behind it. Um, and in this splash pad, that has actually become a walking surface. So this is a picture of a park, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later as well. Another option is then the seawall. Uh, this is a picture of Northwestern University and their new athletic center. Um, when they built or were planning this athletic center, it was 2013 and they had this wide, beautiful sandy beach in front of it. Um, but uh, we recognized right away that there were some issues in its placement and its relationship to the water. And only having very limited real estate, a seawall was the only option in this case. Uh, so fortunately, we made this, this wall very beautiful, but you can see how tall it needed to be and the uniqueness of its design uh, to protect that, that building behind it. So where uh, hardened shorelines are most appropriate is where we have very large waves um, and steep slopes leading up to that, that shoreline edge or just open shorelines, um, particularly on the north or south sides of the lake where our waves can get very large offshore and breaking onshore um, still results in a lot of wave energy. Now, those are appropriate uh, shore protection, and that does not cover the wide range of things that you could actually do. But there are also unsuitable shoreline protection that we have seen people using along the shoreline. And these include old cars, wooden pallets, rubber tires, uh, people throwing old appliances, anything from a junk junkyard or a landfill uh, material. This is inappropriate. This is trash. Uh, ultimately, this will end up in the lake and just because it's in the lake doesn't mean it's gone. It is still there and can be found um, decades later as, as I'm doing of, of old uh, residential properties that were abandoned and not removed. 
Uh, you're just finding little pieces of things. Also inappropriate, but more commonly used is concrete rubble with reinforcement in it. Uh, Seawalls made of gabions for the long term. Uh, again, they're appropriate for a short term, but maybe not for the long term. Uh, the flat concrete rubble from construction demolition. I hear people telling me they want to use this. That, that's very slabby and, and plate-like, and that's actually what's shown in that picture on the left. Um, anything that's slabby like that is not, it doesn't have a lot of weight, but a lot of surface area. So if a wave comes up underneath it, it can just lift it, you know, and throw it around. Um, and in fact, that is what happened. And over the years of this, uh, um, concrete material being rolled around, it took on the shape of, of looking like rocks and, and rolled into these shapes. Now, what you see in that picture does have some uh, woody debris, but most of that is not sticks, but actually rebar. It's twisted rebar. So you can imagine that this area is now um, uninhabitable by, by individuals looking to recreate against the water uh, and will require a massive cleanup to get rid of all of this material. So I know I said earlier, what can I do about it? But that's not really the way we should look at things. We should say, what can we do about it? Because a collective, um, a cooperative approach is the best approach. Now on the top side of this picture, all five of those homes banded together and determined that they needed uh, shoreline protection and they are all protected. Where in the bottom, there was more of an individual approach and you can see that the erosion around the sides of those systems resulted in loss of, of three properties. So if you're thinking of doing something that is going to affect your neighbor, talk to them. Uh, it is a good opportunity to, to band together and also save costs in construction by continuing um, some type of shoreline treatment. Now I did say, you know, it wraps around the side. So let's talk about that for a second. A lot of people will put the shore protection on their property because that's as far as you can go. Uh, and they will create a straight line across the entire thing to maximize their footprint. So I put in here what the property lines are, but those waves don't care. They don't care about property lines. They don't care about edges. Um, if they want to push up into it, they're going to start to flank around those sides and erode it. So now you have no room but to create perpendicular protection further into your property. And you can see how this will go on and on and on. Uh, so I talked about people banding together. This is a, a, a great project that was done uh, that took many homeowners and them all banding together to determine that their bluff was unstable and no one of them, not one of them, could afford the, the high cost of uh, protecting their bluffs, which were over 60 foot feet high. So what they did was they uh, bounded together with the munici municipality. They provided uh, easements or, or temporary um, ownership of the front of that uh, of their property and gave it to the municipality who was able to get uh, grant funds to create a public space. And that's great because none of this was publicly um, accessible. It was all privately um, held minus the public parks, I should say. And that actually resulted in uh, these drawings, which might look a little uh, familiar because that, that is, this area is actually currently under construction and includes those revetments along the shoreline. But you can see how tall that, that bluff was. And if any one of those homeowners was asked to protect that themselves, um, they would have a very hefty price tag. So let's start bounding these typologies with the solutions together. And if we start looking at uh, sandy beaches, we have our, our softer solutions, which include the beach nourishment and the vegetation. So dune installation, dunes should be seen as uh, they're, they're, they're your safety account. If your beach starts to erode, they're in the back and they're ready to deploy additional sands for you. That's how they work in nature, that's how they work uh, in places that are, are um, human influenced and developed. But you do want to vegetate them because we want to hold on to these and not have wind start uh, eroding them away either. So your beach nourishment is placed. A lot of this is placed above the water surface and therefore has that very steep front slope. And over time, uh, waves are going to come and they're just going to want to flatten that out and start to pull it offshore. Now, how long nourishment lasts? 
It's a guess because it has to do with water levels and the storm events that you have. If water levels remain high, then we're gonna still have those plunging waves that are just pulling that sand offshore into bars. But if you nourish uh, and the water level goes down, like now is a great time, uh, that is going to retain on its shoreline much longer uh, for a, a longer period of time, I should say. So other things that you can look at to do with uh, sandy beaches are your structural solutions. Uh, you have your, your groins that again have the erosion and deposition on either side, or you can do your emerged offshore breakwaters that have, um, uh, depending on how far they are from the shoreline, the sand is going to build up behind it, maybe even touch it, or you can do a submerged breakwater um, and all of these systems, they're structures, so they do require regulatory approval, but your submerged uh, breakwaters break that wave energy and ask the sand to stay around a little bit longer. So that's when you get a smaller hold of sand on the shoreline, um, but you do stop that rate, or I should say slow down that rate along the shoreline. So if we move over to erodible bluffs, there are the basic stabilization techniques. And uh, the biggest one that you can do for an erodible bluff is your toe protection. Your toe is the most important part of your bluff. If you lose it, that slope will fail, uh, maybe not immediately, but over time it does wanna correct itself. It does wanna get back to its, its happy place. Uh, what you can do on the slope, if you uh, have a lot of exposed um, soft soils or erodible soils, is you want to install vegetation. If you have a good amount of trees with tree coverage that are preventing this vegetation from growing, that's when you want to be selective and remove some of those trees because the best um, ability to hold that slope in place is your deep rooted vegetation, if it is not already stable. And your potential failure surfaces for those deep slides like that avulsion I showed earlier, that's where your toe protection comes in. It can't be too small. It has to be large enough that it pre prevents that slope failure from, from occurring. Now, beyond just the, the bluff itself, there are things that you can do. This is a wonderful graphic that came out of Sea Grant that talks about all of these um, coastal erosion uh, and some natural and, and some man-made. And I'm just gonna focus on the one man-made here is surface water runoff. Uh, if your uh, land is graded so that all of that storm water actually runs out and over your bluff, it is taking with it vegetation and seeds and all that wonderful stuff that is keeping those erodible um, soils in place. So this also includes your downspouts. So if you have downspouts that are coming off your house and focused toward the bluff, you might want to redirect those in another direction. Another option is to create a vegetative barrier along the edge of your bluff, at the top of your bluff, uh, to prevent that water um, from spilling over. It's kind of like a rain garden at the top. Okay, so uh, for other shoreline stabilization techniques for bluffs, um, include this, this uh, foursome. Uh, we have uh, the fill slope stabilization. This is pushing out into the lake and filling out and creating a more um, appropriate slope. We have the other option of cutting back the slope stabilization. You should realize though, this does mean losing some of the real estate at the top of the block, which is extending into your property. Um, you can give and take and have the cut fill stabilization where you're taking from one and putting into another area. Or you could even do a terraced bluff stabilization, which is interior walls um, uh, along that bluff. Now I've seen people actually use these terraces to create livable spaces of patios and, and seating areas and wonderful gardens as well. So those, those are, there's programming opportunities for that. Going over to revetment, this is a typical um, revetment construction. A lot of people just, just think if I get a bunch of rock and shove it over the edge, I'm good to go. It's not the case. Uh, there is still pores in between all of those rocks. The wave energy goes in and it grabs all those soft sediments and pulls them out. So you're still going to have erosion and you're going to have settlement 
of that revetment if designed in such a way. So you need to have a layered system, which is what this, this diagram is showing. And the best thing to do is then put some geotextile or something that is really creating that hard barrier between your soft sediments and your rocks on the outside. Um, you also want a gentle slope. If you get too sleep, steep, this is going to want to start to slide down the hill. Now, a good uh, rule of thumb when sizing rock on the outside of your, your revetment is that you want to look at the waves that are breaking onto the system, and you want your stone diameter to be about 40% of that wave height. So if you have a 10-foot wave, uh, you need a 40-foot, uh, 40, uh, a 4-foot stone on the outside, which is a very heavy stone. Um, and may require its own truck to even get there. So uh, things to think about when sizing stone, because if you undersize it, it's just gonna disappear over time. Now, if you already have a revetment that is being overtopped, there are some opportunities for you. You can widen the crest. This means creating a larger splash pad behind that, that crest where it is now. Uh, and make sure to install that geotextile underneath again, because you don't want any pitting underneath it. So you can widen the crest. Now, if, you have, if your overtopping is, is severe uh, and, and it's causing issues uh, at the top, you might look at a temporary measure of installing some type of crown wall. Um, it's, a, an, again, a barrier and notching that into the ground or holding that some way so that when these extreme storm waves come, uh, that you have that barrier that is rejecting that energy back in, into the other direction. And these are just two options. For your seawalls, uh, if a scour hole is forming, you want to fill that with scour stone. This has to be appropriately sized again, otherwise it can just be pulled back out. Now, if in this case, in this picture, the seawall is definitely too low because uh, we do have that overtopping occurring. So you can actually increase the height of that seawall by adding onto the top. And, and as I mentioned, uh, waves hitting a seawall are going to jut really high up in the air and bring the water down on the backside. So you need to protect that area, again, by uh, stone or, or geoweb or some type of vegetation, something along those lines to hold that um, more safely. And if all else fails, fails beyond that, um, not even fails, but you're going to end up with a lot of water in your yard. So you want to make uh, protections for the backside um, that accommodate that, that overtopping and uh, redirect that water and drain it off of your property. Now it's not a common or, or, or not um, a well-loved approach, but there is managed retreat and this means moving the, the infrastructure that is threatened. This is a case of a lighthouse in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina that was moved um, because the, there were just no good options for protecting this lighthouse, uh, which I used to visit back in the 90s and at the late 90s, it was moved. It was put onto railroad tracks and pushed and natural gravity actually moved this over the course of a year into its new location, which is much further inland because there was just no other, no other ways to protect this in a long-term solution. And you might wonder, do people do this? Oh, you betcha. Yeah. Uh, people will move their homes further from the, the top of the shoreline if there is just no other solutions. In this case, it is a, uh, a small house and probably not a very high value, uh, valued property. Um, now, the, the, the shoreline, you can just about make it out, but there was a massive slip and it brought the, the uh, crest of that bluff very close to this gentleman's house or this family's house. And they decided the cost of relocating the house and pushing it back um, was the best option and the best path forward. So by no means are any of these solutions in itself the best solution. It, uh, it actually requires um, a multitude of techniques and uh, it, installing, say, nourishment with offshore breakwaters or submerged breakwaters um, in combination might be the best avenue for you because each site is unique. Uh, so I'm not promoting one of these above the other. Um, the biggest thing to, to realize is that the lakes are dynamic, and this means you have to adapt and be resilient to what's coming your way. So who do I need to work with to get all of this done? <laughs> well, uh, first thing you want to do is work with your uh, regulatory bodies. Now, they come in, in two forms. We have our, our federal, which is your Army Corps of Engineers, 
And then you have your, your state agencies, and these include your Department of Natural Resources and your uh, environmental groups. Um, here's just a handful of, of them on the right. Uh, now, their jurisdiction is different uh, depending on where you live and what state you're in. And now most of them will recognize the ordinary high water mark. For some of the agencies, this is a flat elevation, is a static elevation, um, but more typically this, and right now we're above that elevation, I should mention, because we are at historic highs, uh, they're going to look at a demarcation along the shoreline. They're looking for that point where vegetation starts or debris ends, and that becomes your ordinary high water mark. So it could be that flat elevation if water levels are low, or it might be this, this movable system, uh, which then needs to be flagged along the shoreline and identified. Now, um, in these states, Indiana, New York, and Wisconsin, there's private ownership up to the ordinary high water mark, and then anything below that is held in public trust, uh, which means that people can recreate in that area. Um, this is important because it's not the same in every state. In other states, there's an overlapping ownership, which means that the, the state agencies handle things that are at the water or down to the, the low water mark as their, their, uh, their boundary. And then the private ownership is above that. So you have this overlapping ownership where, uh, such as in Michigan, you can walk in front of someone's house, but you cannot stop and recreate because they actually still own that land and you would be considered, uh, in, in a light sense of the term, trespassing. So the one state that actually has a very strong private ownership is Ohio, and that extends all the way down to wherever the water is or the low water mark. And this is a little bit different um, throughout the communities there, uh, but a very strong private ownership there. Um, beyond these agencies, these are other uh, uh, associations that you're gonna have to deal with when you're looking at installing shoreline protection. Uh, the biggest one being the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they are very concerned about contamination and water quality. So if you're moving anything, even sand that is already there, they have to get involved. Um, they want to get involved for, for our own good. So doing it the right way. Um, <laughs> this is steps for a shoreline protection project. First thing you wanna do is find someone who knows what they are talking about. And this is not everyone. Uh, coastal engineering is, is a bit of a, a specialty. So you're gonna to wanna to look for someone who has a history in um, consulting along uh, the shoreline. It doesn't have to be a consultant. It could be a technical advisor, um, but you wanna find one of them. You want them to perform the analysis and the design. Every, again, every location is a bit uh, unique. So you're, yeah, get them to do the analysis and design. Then you're gonna prepare and submit the permit applications. Um, the regulators are gonna come back and maybe ask for some modifications before they give you permit approvals. You're then gonna solicit the bids, select your contractor, and then construction. Then you get to build whatever it is um, that you need to protect your, your property. But it doesn't stop there. You still have to monitor for damage and repair and enhance as necessary to keep that for the many years to come. So this is a big one. What is this gonna cost? Everyone always asks me that. Well, I'm gonna give you some big ranges because every site is different. But if we're talking in general terms, there are your initial costs of construction. Your design and engineering is around about 8% of the construction cost. This can go up or down, but this is what you should imagine for uh, your consultant or your designer. And then there's construction. If it's sand placement, anywhere from 250 to 1,000, depending on how wide your beach is and how much sand you actually need. Your breakwaters, um, rock is particularly expensive right now because there's a shortage of rock. Uh, everyone needs the larger uh, rocks uh, to put along the shoreline and therefore it's supply and demand. So you're gonna be paying a premium now versus if you had done this back in 2013. Uh, Riprap revetments, um, they are, breakwaters are double-sided, so they just naturally have more uh, rock in them where riprap revetments are kind of one-sided if you're thinking about a trapezoid. Um, so there's less material, but they can still range up to uh, 3,000, even higher for, for very tall revetments. Sheep pile, um, th there is a price fluctuation on steel due to tariffs. So uh, this has changed over, over the years. Sometimes it's very low and sometimes it's very high. And depending on how much 
um, sheet pile you actually need. If it's a cantilever wall or a tie back wall, that has a, a heavy um, influence on the cost as well. And then vegetation. Uh, each plug, I understand from buying per recently, uh, each plug of dune grass was about $5. So you can fit a bunch of them within to a square foot. And now if you also need topsoil and dressing and pr preparation, that those costs can run up to $200 a square foot. It just depends on what you need. Um, also keep in mind that if you are in an urban center, uh, if you are down toward Chicago, prices go up. It's just the cost of of uh, materials, getting materials there, the cost of people, um, that pushes up uh, costs. Also, if you're in an area where access is very difficult or you're in a rural area, um, that's going to drive up costs also. So once it's installed, then you have your maintenance costs. Now this can be all over the place. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you risk uh, for what you're dealing with. Now it is uh, lake level and storm intensity dependent, but your sand placement, again, that is erodible, so it's high risk. And once you start a sand nourishment program, um, expect that you should be earmarking money to, to maintain that and continue that. Breakwaters are lower risk. They are more adaptable uh, to, to adjustments. Um, if you lose one rock here or there, that does not destroy the entire system. So. Uh, that those are a lower risk system. Now, again, if you do have a, um, if you do create a breakwater, say out of those um, stacked concrete blocks, that is higher risk. So it's it's knowing your materials and, and how this is all working as a system. Riprap events, same thing with the riprap, low, lower risk. Uh, sheet pile is, is also lower risk, but much um, harder to repair or replace later on. So your initial costs are usually higher uh, so that they prepare you for, for a future um, of low maintenance. Vegetation, high risk. Uh, it could be hit by one storm and completely disappear. So uh, high risk solution there. Uh, your other considerations are at the end of life. Um, if you put this in now because water levels are high and you need to protect your property, Remember, this is still there later on. When water levels go back down, um, it's, it's in your way, particularly if it's a, a hard solution like the ones that, that I covered. Uh, so there might even be then cost of, of removing this um, later on. Something to consider. Uh, and then cost of relocation. And I know I'm running over a little bit and I apologize, I'm almost done. Um, cost of relocation, if you do wanna relocate your home, uh, balance that against what is the cost of um, maintaining your bluff or your frontage and protecting it fully. Uh, you should balance those things. So funding, funding sources. If you're a private uh, property owner, um, then it has to be privately funded. There are some opportunities to get some aid from FEMA if there's a massive disaster, or some uh, maybe your insurance will cover some of the, the damages that you're, you're seeing. Um, and then there are also, in some areas, special improvement districts, and this is uh, beautifying an area or protecting it uh, for historical value, and you can even get some uh, funding for that. As a public shoreline, you, there are grant programs, a number of them, both at the state and federal level, there are also philanthropic entities that are, are willing to um, contribute funds to, to help out it, along the shoreline. Uh, you also get FEMA aid from disasters. And then there's also no and low interest loans um, that can help you pay for this to put this in now. And I'll go through this really quickly. The economics and importance of protecting your coastal investment. If you purchase a, a, a home on the, the shoreline, you're in it for the long haul, but you also have to understand that you're in a dynamic area. Lakefront properties add about 50% values compared to inland properties. Now, what is desirable in a lakefront property is the lower risk. Uh, and that means deep lots with large setbacks so that if you needed to retreat from the shoreline, you can. And if there is shore protection or if you're installing shore protection, make it for the long haul. Something that's going to give you about 25 years service life is more desirable. Now, property value losses accelerate as the erosion proceeds. This kind of makes sense. As erosion is coming in, uh, your property value goes down until um, uh, the infrastructure is completely undermined and then the, the infrastructure has to be abandoned and, and removed and it has zero value. 
Um, and working cooperatively. Now, if you protect your property and your neighbor doesn't, that's still going to cause problems from you for you in the future. And or the municipality that you live and work in, if their beaches disappear and you happen to be in an area that uh, thrives on tourism and, or it gets its economics from tourism, um, that that could be an issue as well. So further learning, if you want to learn all about this yourself, don't trust me. Just because I'm on this webinar, uh, you can go to any of these websites and this is just a small sampling of places that you can uh, further educate yourself on what's going on uh, with the Great Lakes. And uh, always, you are more than welcome to contact me directly if you have any questions or, or just need some advice, or if you need someone to design you some shoreline protection, we, we're here to help. Um, but I'm not the only consultant out there. There are a list of, of other consultants that you can uh, look to on the Sea Grants web pages. Uh, so you just have to, to look and reach out if you have questions. We're always here. And that's my presentation, everyone. Margaret, thanks. That was a tremendous amount of information. And I know we're just a bit long. Um, why don't you come up for air for a bit? And I'm going to ask our uh, Ann Arbor team, uh, Geneva, if she could uh, read maybe a few questions we thought we might try to kick around for 15 minutes. Yep. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Margaret. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, so we had some questions about shorter term solutions like sandbags or snow fences. How do those fit into this broader picture? Uh, well, you know, temporary um, shoreline protection is just that. It's temporary. Uh, and it shouldn't be um, expected that this is going to last the long season. Snow fences are really good for, for wind drift um, of, of sediments and, and holding that on place uh, during those winter months when storm systems and winds are very high. For your um, sandbag solutions, even your bigger ones, they can be impacted by ice. Uh, we have very thick ice here in the Great Lakes, and if any of it is shifting and moving and pushing up onto the shoreline, it could easily puncture those bags. And once they're punctured, they don't always—they don't have the same efficiency that they do as as solid features. Great, thank you. Um, so we had a few people wondering about existing vegetation, especially when it comes to vegetation on bluffs. So if you have a bluff that has some, you know, has been forested for a while and now is starting to slump. Would you recommend removing the trees as they start sliding down, leaving them there to hold it intact? What's the best strategy there? Okay, that's a great question because we have run into that before. If you have uh, trees that actually have surface roots that are spread out and are not holding down into the bluff itself and they start to fall, they can actually rip out the sand, uh, the sediment with it. So if they are already starting to tilt and you see them doing this, there's no option but to get rid of them. And in which case you do want to, to cut them down in an approved manner with some arborists to get that out of there. Um, I would recommend leaving the trunks in place and any exposed soils, filling that in with uh, vegetation to the best of your ability. Um, someone is wondering if they have an existing seawall and are realizing that it's not really tall enough for our current conditions, what are some strategies for adding height? So uh, it depends on what your seawall is made of. And now there are, um, in this case, I actually do like some temporary solutions. Um, there are options of putting in either Jersey barriers or some type of barrier to uh, reduce the amount of, of energy and waves that are coming up onto um, your property. Now, if waves are already hitting your property at average water levels or, or God forbid, low water levels, then you're just way too low. And we need to look at options for increasing the height um, permanently. If that starts to become a visual um, impairment, that we'll have to adjust changes further up onshore as well. Um, but this is this is a location where um, really just a barrier, a Jersey barrier, a, a concrete barrier, something to to elevate the protection from that area. But don't forget drainage holes because you don't want to start to uh, build up water on the backside. Give it somewhere to go. Good point. Some folks were wondering about the, the cyclical nature of lake levels as they um, change throughout the decades. Um, folks are wondering what some of the kind of bullet point causes for those cycles and fluctuations. What are some of the reasons that they're so high right now? And as we look forward into a reality where our climate is changing and these cycles are going to be affected by that, 
what are some broad brush uh, predictions for what we might see moving forward? As I mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, the three main influences to our water level fluctuations are precipitation, uh, runoff, which is just precipitation on land within our watershed, and the evaporation. So that is what's forcing our water levels to go up and down. The projections, if you listen to climate scientists, they are suggesting that we're going to have warmer, wetter weather in our future. And if we think about that, that increases evaporation, but it also increases our, our supply of new water to our lake systems. So where that balances out is the question mark. Um, Army Corps of Engineers, in listening to them speak, or even the National Weather Service and their forecasts, they suggest that we should prepare ourselves for higher highs and lower lows uh, in, in the future, but stop short of giving us an actual uh, threshold. So this is when you're working with um, designers or consultants or, or even just doing it yourself, looking into the past and what we've, we've seen uh, for high water levels and projecting to the future and making sure you have a, a safety factor on top of that when, when designing anything. And high water levels, yes, they seem near and present in the danger, but low water level also has its own set of, of issues as well. So you gotta prepare for that full range plus a little extra for your safety factor. This is Elliot Nelson with Michigan Sea Grant, and I'll just add to a lot of the questions were around the annual cycle or maybe not fully understanding that. So just so right. everyone's aware, there's also just an annual cycle where the water levels go down in the fall and the winter and then back up in the summer. That has a lot to do with thermal expansion, evaporation and precipitation as well. And so I'll just put in the chat a link to the Army Corps of Engineers presentation that they did that goes into a lot more depth about the cycles of the water um, for anyone that's interested. So I'll get that in there in the next couple of minutes. On average for Lake Michigan, there's a change of one foot, but that is just on average. We saw last year, um, this January, we were 14 to 17 inches higher than we were last year in January. So they're little different uh, due to all that precipitation. Summer's always the highest. Excellent. Thank you for that. And thanks for weighing in, Elliot. Uh, we have someone wondering, they have already lost some beach or um, they've lost a lot of beach. Um, is there anything they can do to get it back? If they install a seawall or put in some protections, can they get any of their land back? Um, so if you have a, a, natural, a natural beach in front of your house, um, one way to encourage sand to stick around longer is to break down that wave energy offshore uh, and that will because what we have going on is those twofold cross-shore and longshore transport. So um, offshore breakwaters, either emergent or submerged, will help reduce that, that wave energy um, and naturally build up your, your beach again. Otherwise, you can look into combination of nourishment plus some type of um, wave dampening system. As the water levels start to go back down, if you have a completely natural system and the sediment hasn't been removed from the littoral um, system due to being captured somewhere else, then that sand that is offshore in those bars, it will naturally start to march itself back onto the shoreline. This is Pat Dover with Smith Group. Uh, Margaret, if you don't mind, I might weigh in just a little bit. I think part of that question as I was reading it was about if this was where my land used to be, but now it's all eroded and the water lines way behind where my land line used to be. Um, can I put the structures out where my land used to be um, where my property line used to be. And I, I think that that's a regulatory issue. I, I think Margaret talked about um, the ordinary high water mark. Um, there are riparian issues. So where your land line is or where those riparian, uh, um, uh, where that riparian line is, is going to vary. It's going to vary uh, from, from property to property. A lot of property owners don't necessarily know exactly where their property line is as it relates to the shoreline of Lake Michigan or any of the Great Lakes, um, but it's really that riparian area that you have to be aware of and you really need to talk to the regulatory authorities to understand where that ordinary high water mark is, where they will allow you to build to and where they will allow you to define uh, as private versus uh, riparian. Yeah, 
Great, thanks for weighing in there. We have a lot of questions left in the question and answer box. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Some of you are asking really good questions about your own properties, which is not necessarily something that we can answer uh, in a context like this. Uh, what would be your advice, Margaret, for people who have these very specific questions? Who should they reach out to right now? Um, I, your, your first is, is your, um, your regulators, actually. Uh, sorry to put that on the regulators. Um, but if you don't want to go out to a consultant for, for design work and such, um, your regulators are a good starting point, but they are not always engineers. Uh, or I should say um, practitioners along the coastal shoreline. Um, you can also get in touch with people from, from Sea Grant for some, some information or even just to, to get links to other information to self-educate. And if you wanted to uh, reach out to um, someone like myself or anyone else on this, this panel, uh, we'd be happy to, to answer your questions um, in, in a high level way without uh, getting too specific because we would have to come out and visit your site and, and take a look. Every site is um, is has its own um, um, identity and we would have to get to know it a bit better to answer specific questions. Um, but I would say that's your best place to start is with your C grants, your educational institutions, and your regulators. So this is Mark Breederland again. I want to just thank the whole team. Um, lots of good information shared on a lot of different uh, techniques and uh, soft engineering approaches where appropriate. Unfortunately, there's not as many of those in the Great Lakes as we would like to see because of the uh, high wave uh, energies that, that need to be dealt with. I am going to thank um, Margaret and our whole team that was able to uh, put this together and uh, uh, all the participants. And uh, we just want to uh, say thank you for your time. And we hope it was uh, beneficial, whatever uh, jurisdiction you're in uh, across the Great Lakes. And uh, we look forward to uh, further dialogue on the topic as we all try to manage uh, through these uh, high water years. And hopefully we'll look back in a few and we'll be back into more of a normal, uh, normal water uh, um, uh, kind of a sweet spot, we could say. So thanks again, have a great night.